John's relationship with the church before the interdict is quite good. By the church, we mean the Catholic Church, that's the Roman Catholic Church, which was the only church in, in, in England at this time, in medieval England. The head of the Roman Catholic Church is the Pope, who lives in Rome, um, often called the Holy See. Um, and the Pope, who's the head of the papacy in Rome, has two representatives in England who are responsible for overseeing the church within England. And these two representatives who oversee the church in England are called archbishops. And they each are responsible for a province. A province is a section of, the, uh, of England uh, that they will oversee. And that's marked on the map by the red line. All north of the red line is to be overseen by the archbishop of York and that bit above the red line is often called the uh, Archbishopric of York or the Archdiocese of York or the Province of York. South of the red line is to be overseen by the Archbishop of Canterbury and that bit south of the red line is sometimes called uh, the Archdiocese of Canterbury, the Archbishopric of Canterbury or the Province of Canterbury. And now these two archbishops, there's an exception to the Archbishop of Canterbury, is the more senior. He's given the title the Primate of all England. Uh, primate coming means sort of like Premier. He's out of the two, the more senior. Each archdiocese is then divided into a diocese, ruled by a bishop, also called a bishopric. And they're usually focused on Anglo Saxon kingdoms and within each archdiocese or within uh sorry not within the archdiocese within each diocese or within each bishopric uh there's a cathedral city uh where the cathedral is and then each diocese then actually has within it parish churches in every single community of england and that gives the church a huge amount of reach it's something that john wants to uh keep on side with because it allows him to get messages out around the kingdom really efficiently. He also likes to keep the church on side because the church is providing him with a, f a steady flow of good administrators. Most royal clerks are from the clergy. Most of his um, high-ranking officials are from the clergy as well. And there's a reason for that. One is that actually the clergy are the literate people within England. They're the people that can read and write. Also, the clergy are not supposed to be married so therefore they're not going to actually be able to be distracted from their work for the king and that they also haven't or not supposed to have children and therefore that means that they're not they're going to be interested in actually furthering royal authority um, rather than actually trying to further their children's authority uh, children's um, inheritance and so john needs the church and this is a church that is actually flourishing that in the previous hundred years um, the number of monks and nuns has gone up that this is a flourishing thriving church when john becomes king 1199 the only fly or potential fly in the ointment is the pope um, who is consecrated that means installed uh, as pope the year before john becomes king in 1198 and that's innocent III. Pope Innocent III is a lawyer pope. That means that actually he's an expert in ecclesiastical, um, that's church law, sometimes called canon law. And Innocent III, this lawyer pope, has one very clear aim. And he makes that aim explicit in his very first sermon that he preaches after he is consecrated as pope. And that is that the pope less than god but greater than man judge of all men and judge by none the pope is saying that actually he is below god and no one can judge what he actually does or says and then he writes a letter a week later saying that actually the liberty of the church is nowhere better served than where the roman church obtains full power both in temporal that means political and in spiritual matters so, the Pope, this lawyer Pope, is about ensuring that papal 
authority is not questioned and that he's going to reassert the power of the papacy that he feels has been challenged by kings all over Europe. And that's going to become a problem for John because here's a pope who's actually trying to push papal power and that's going to lead him unfortunately into conflict with John. Um, one is just by the fact that actually um, it's bad luck that he unfortunately was king at this point. Now John's religious beliefs are often open to question. Some people see him as being irreligious but actually there's evidence to show that he was religious. After his coronation um, in 1199, instead of rushing straight back to France to actually go and take the fight back to Philip and Arthur, John goes out of his way to visit two shrines at Canterbury Cathedral and at St Albans. Also, John, during the course of his life, pays for about three and a half thousand beggars each year to be fed. He also finds a monastery, an abbey at Bewley. But the chronicle view of John is often that he was not religious. Uh, one chronicle talks about him not actually having the bread of communion since he's 21. Now the Chronicle talks about the fact that actually um, he um, basically moans about the length of uh, Bishop Hugh of Lincoln's sermon. He orders that he hurries it up. Another one talks about the fact that actually he's blasphemous. Um, but John, it isn't clear cut. There's elements of him being religious. I mean, he pays for prayers to be said uh, for his dead brother. But there's also evidence that people thought that he wasn't religious. And so what we can say is that actually for the time, he was conventionally devout. That actually he was, like everybody else, he was run-of-the-mill, a run-of-the-mill Christian. Not somebody who was exceptionally religious, but not somebody who was irreligious. There are two issues that John and the church clashed on before the interdict. One is taxation and one is appointments, appointments of bishops and, uh, and, and ultimately the archbishop. The church started off actually by being incredibly useful for John. When he needed an annulment of his marriage, annulment means sort of like a never happened. Annulment of his marriage uh, it never happened because it wasn't actually legal in canon law or in church law, ecclesiastical law. When he needed an annulment of his marriage with uh, Isabella of Gloucester so that he could get remarried, the church obliged quite quickly. However, when he needed a carcuage to be paid in 1200, um, that's a tax, a lot of the clergy refused to pay it. Particularly, one monastic order refused to pay it, the, the Cistercians. And John was angry with them and actually said that he would threaten to confiscate um, all of the grazing land for sheep in the royal forests and Hubert Walter the Archbishop of Canterbury um, weighs in and says that actually John's uh, wrong that he shouldn't actually uh, be coming up with harsh tests like this and John has to back down um, and pay them compensation and also he ends up find, found in the Abbey of Bewley um, as a penance as an apology for it. John sometimes doesn't get his own way either. when it comes to appointments. Um, in France, in 1201, John's appointment to be Bishop of Sees isn't chosen. Uh, the person who's appointed is a, is a local man called Sylvester. And John isn't happy about this, but actually he, he, he doesn't really have the influence in France at this point because of the fact that actually um, people are starting to see that there's 
going to be um, potential conflict between John and Philip. And so the cathedral chapter decides that actually they're going to ignore John and appoint Sylvester as the Bishop of Seas. But when Hubert Walter dies in July 1205, that frees up the most powerful position with the English church, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And John talks about actually how this is going to mean that he is at last able to be in charge of his own kingdom. Hubert Walter was just, well, sorry, was Chancellor, and that's the head of the Chancery before John becomes king. And he doesn't always see eye to eye with John, for example, over the car carriage. And John feels that actually his death will allow him to become master in his own kingdom. He'll be able to appoint somebody who is going to be loyal, somebody who will actually not question him. Um, and that's what he's hoping for, that actually he'll be able to get his candidate chosen. And he's got every right to believe it because every king of, of England up to this point had got their choice of Archbishop of Canterbury. John favours the Bishop of Norwich, uh, that's a man called John de Grey, to be the next Archbishop of Canterbury. He's also the Royal Secretary, somebody who he thinks that actually he can reward with a position for being loyal. And that's also a reason why John needs to be able to have control of appointments is that he wants to make sure that loyal people go into the positions of power within the church but also he wants to use these positions of power as rewards for people who are loyal and so on the death of Hubert Walter um, John postpones the election of his successor so um, usually in this period um, most of the cathedrals in England or a lot of the cathedrals in England are monastic communities, they're monasteries and therefore the election of um, their the bishop or the archbishop and um, they are elected by monks who form up the chapter. The chapter is the meeting where all the monks sit down and they vote who's going to be their next leader. And so John has the traditional right um, as king to actually say when these elections should happen. Um, John pushes the election back um, because he wants to do it after the summer because he needs to actually have um, the time for potential campaigning in France. And so he pushes the election back to uh, the end of 1205, um, which is fine because although you're thinking, well, hang on, Hubert's already dead, there was often gaps um, between the death of one archbishop and the appointment of, a ne of the next. It's nothing unusual. So he pushes the election back. However, in this period of time, the monks at Canterbury, some of them elect Reginald, their sub-prior, um, as their archbishop. And so they go off to Rome quietly to go and get the Pope to confirm the appointments. Because once that's happened, there's nothing that John can do about it. The bishops of England, so all the bits that's coloured on the map, they actually write a letter to the Pope. They say that actually, traditionally, in the further back in the past, the bishops had a say in the Pope, uh, sorry, in the Archbishop as well. And so the bishops write a letter saying they traditionally should have a say. And so Innocent is in Rome when he gets the arrival of Reginald and a group of monks saying that Reginald is the new archbishop and he should be confirmed. And he gets this letter. Uh, and he gets his letter from the bishops. And so at the moment... Innocent doesn't know what to do. He's the lawyer pope. He wants to make sure he's doing things properly. And so he needs more information to work out. Actually, is, has Reginald been elected according to the common tradition of how archbishops are chosen within England? And so he writes to uh, the abbots of St. Albans um, and Reading. So that's the abbot of St. Albans, the abbot of Reading. And he writes to the dean of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. 
and it asks them uh, to give him information about from their um, experiences their very experienced i.e. elderly um, clergymen generally how our archbishops uh, bishops been chosen in the past and so he's going to wait for their reply also in rome at about this time um is peter de roche peter de roche was john's choice of appointment to the bishop of winchester and there was a dispute over who should be the next bishop of winchester John wanted to have Peter de Roche. Others voted for Richard Poor. Uh, John actually took Richard Poor supporters prisoner. Um, and Peter de Roche goes to Rome um, to actually try and see if he can force. Um, for him to be chosen and what actually innocent does do in the end is the actually innocent decides to quash both elections and has the new one and de roche is actually elected as bishop of winchester so de roche is in rome when he hears about the fact that actually you've got the supporters of reginald saying that reginald has been elected so he very quickly gets a message back to england to john um, and John is incredibly angry that actually the monks at Canterbury have gone against his will. And so he goes there as quick as he can and makes it clear to the remaining monks uh, that if they know what's good for them, they will do as they're damn well told and elect John de Grey. Which they very helpfully, once he's gone, do, fearing that the repercussions will be serious if they don't. And so a group of monks travel to rome to actually say this is the is the election that actually john de gray has been rightfully elected as the archbishop of canterbury and so poor innocence in rome that he's got reginald and a group of monks he's got a letter saying that actually no 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 if you go back 50 60 70 80 90 100 odd years the bishops had a say and then you've actually got um, ultimately agreed among saying that John de Grey is the Archbishop. And so Innocent decides that actually he's going to have to look into this more. So he then actually sets, or he, he writes a letter in March saying that he need March 1206, saying that actually he needs more information. He says that he wants the... Um, abbots of St Albans, the abbot of Reading and the dean of Paul's to give their um, evidence that they found and that actually uh, he wants um, representatives of all sides to come to Rome and they should be in Rome by September. John sends as his representative the abbot of Bewley that's the one that he's created, the monastery that he's created as an apology. Um, so he sends the Abbot of Bewley um, with two sheriffs to Rome to represent him with a large pot of money to bribe their way if necessary. And so the innocent's going to listen to the available evidence and work out which one of these two has been rightly elected according to traditional custom. After looking at the available evidence before him, Innocent took the decision to actually quash, that means um, sort of squeeze, collapse, get rid of both elections. He says that actually Reginald can't be, Reginald's election can't actually be considered to be a valid election because um, he had happened without permission from John. And John de Grey's election actually isn't valid because you can't actually um, elect somebody um, 
until a previous um, potential candidate has been confirmed or rejected and also not all the monks are involved. And so Innocent quashes both of them and asks the monks who are in Rome, because by this point most of the monks are in Rome from Canterbury, to elect again. And they can't agree. Some of them still go for Reginald, some of them still go for John de Grey, scared of what King John's going to do. So Innocent introduces a compromise candidate. And the compromise candidate they introduces is um, a man called Stephen Langton. Stephen Langton was an incredibly well-respected, intelligent churchman, um, an Englishman by birth, who had been out of England for about 30 years by this point, who has got a reputation for being incredibly able and also fiercely intelligent. He's been involved with the University of Paris, the Sorbonne. Uh, he knows Innocent personally. He's also actually met Philip and that uh, he's known Philip on crusade. Um, and Stephen Langton is rewarded with a benefice in France. That means that he gets money from the Cathedral of Notre Dame um, in Paris um, to be able to give him some money so that he can carry on doing his studies. And this compromise candidate, um, who Innocent thinks will be accepted by both sides because of the fact that Langton is a well-respected churchman, um, is proposed. And the monks, on balance, go, well, actually, this, this seems like a, a reasonable compromise. Uh, we're not all going to agree on Reginald. We're not all going to agree on John de Grey. Here's a man who's respected. Um, and so they vote for him. And he's chosen as the um, Archbishop in election in December 1206. John then receives a letter um, from Innocent saying this is what's happened. And the reason why John gets his letter is that um, the Pope wants royal assent. So that usually when the election has happened, um, the king gives royal assent. He says that it is valid. Um, the two representatives of John in Rome, the two sheriffs who were there, along with the Abbot of Bewley, to represent his interests. When they're asked, um, can you on John's behalf give this royal assent? Um, they go, no, because they know that John is not going to be happy. And so Innocent writes to John saying that this is what happens, and, and he says that actually Langton will be a very good candidate. John won't accept Langton. He won't accept it for a number of reasons. One is the fact that actually he will be the first king for many years who hasn't had his candidate chosen as archbishop. That this is about the procedure and royal power and not about the erosion of it by innocent. Also, it's personal to Stephen Langton that John thinks that Stephen Langton is not going to be loyal, um, that he's not somebody who's worked for him that he's not somebody um, that he can trust because he thinks that his connections to Philip uh, are going to be a potential problem. And so, as a sign of his displeasure, John has the Sheriff of Kent and his mercenary captain, Falk de Cantaloupe, um, go to Canterbury and evict all but 13 very old and infirm monks. And, what is, and that's to send a message to Rome that actually John is not happy. And what ensues is six months of Innocent trying to persuade John to accept Stephen Langton as Archbishop. And during these six months of persuasion, John doesn't really back down. He won't accept Stephen Langton because of the fact that he feels that royal authority is being challenged. Um, and 
after six months of trying to persuade John, in the end, Stephen Langton is consecrated as Archbishop. So that means that he's installed as Archbishop um, in June 1207 by Innocent. Now, part of the reason why John is so angry is that actually he's usually had his way with his up until the consecration of Langton in 1207, there'd been eight bishops who had, uh, for whatever, left their bishopric and they were vacant. And in those cases, five of the people who filled them were John's supporters. They were people that, when John said, so when John said, I want these five people to be rewarded, they were. Um, two of the others were leading barons who actually John was pleased that they were rewarded. So up until 1207, John had got his way on the appointment of people to positions within the church and therefore actually this seemed to him to be a huge affront. Innocence therefore now wants Langton to be able to come to England to be able to actually do his job as Archbishop and John won't let him in. John refuses him, him to come to the country because he's not happy with the fact that actually royal authority has been challenged. By the time we get to August 1207, Innocent writes um, to the bishops of Ely, London and Worcester and gets them to go to John to try to persuade him that John should accept Langston as Archbishop, he should allow him into the country and that actually if he doesn't then there's a chance that the Pope could actually issue an interdict. Nothing changes, John still won't let Langton in. And so the Pope changed his tax. So in November 1207, he then writes to the English barons, actually saying uh, to them that um, John is obviously being misled um, and that actually they should encourage John to let Langton in. John at this point changes his, ta his tactic. It looks as though he's open to the negotiation. So he sends um, the abbot of Bewley, who's now back from Rome, back to Rome um, to go and talk to the Pope and to present his point of view strongly that actually he should agree not to challenge royal authority and that actually um, future elections should happen the way that they've always done that actually the king has an influence in them. Also, John opens negotiations with Simon Langton, Stephen's brother. So there's actually still a way out here that both sides are very much open to talking. But by the time we get to 1208, the start of it, it's clear that these talks are going nowhere. That innocence will not back down because of what we said to start with. That actually this is a pope who wants to ensure that papal authority um, is not um, limited in any way. And we've got in John a king who is determined that after losing royal power in France, he's not going to lose influence within his own kingdom. And so because there's always this threat of interdict in the background, as he knows very well. Um, in 1208, March 1208, John becomes prepared for it. He realises that this is highly likely to happen. And so he appoints commissioners um, around England who are going to confiscate clergy, the clergy's land if any of them try to enforce any interdict that comes. The Pope, when he realises that actually John is prepared for an interdict that he's not going to back down, um, he issues the interdict also in March 1208 after John has appointed the commissioners. And so you can see that actually John's relationship with the church is usually quite good. Um, and that in 1205, John believed that he was standing up for royal power and custom. That the kings had always had a say in who was the next archbishop and that John felt that he had to make a stand on this if he was to ensure that whoever succeeded him as king didn't have limits on royal authority.
By putting England under an interdict, Innocent hoped that John would, first of all, accept the appointments of Stephen Langton and allow him to come into England so that he could perform his job as the Archbishop of Canterbury and Primate of All England. But more importantly for Innocent, that John would accept that not only with elections, but with church affairs more widely, the Pope had supremacy. And how the interdict was meant to achieve this was that it would cause unease and disquiet amongst the religious population of England, who would ultimately um, force John to come to terms with the Pope. But he didn't straight away. And the reason for that is that John had used his time of negotiation to actually shore up his support amongst the barons. When the interdict was enforced, John put his plans to confiscate land into action. One of the first things that he did was previously the Sheriff of Kent and Forks to Cantaloupe, who had um, confiscated the land off Canterbury Cathedral, well, they were replaced by a moderate. And one of the first things he did was John actually made sure um, that these two men took the land back. He also made sure that sheriffs all over England confiscated lands from priests, from cathedrals, from monasteries. That his mercenaries also took part in the confiscation of land as did loyal barons that he felt he could trust, such as his own half-brother, the Earl of Salisbury. And this confiscation of land was not meant to be permanent. What it was was the taking of land and the using of it of, to actually get the clergy to pay a fine to get the land back to use. And John's justification for this was, well... The land is there so that the church has money to carry out its work. The church is refusing to carry out its work because there's an interdict so that there's a suspension of uh, church services um, and other church affairs. Therefore, the church doesn't need the land. And it was successful at raising money. The clergy paid the fines quite quickly. One example would be the abbot of St Albans who had to pay um, and did pay 600 marks uh, for the returning of uh, the estates of St Albans Abbey. And he wasn't alone. Five bishops. Three cathedral chapters. And the abbots of 14 monasteries paid for their land back. And to be fair, apart from the taking of land um, and also the occasional um, taking of um, housekeepers, in inverted comments, uh, of priests hostage on the understanding that they pay money back, um, apart from that, things really carried on in England as normal. Church courts continued to operate. And most of the clergy actually stayed in England. The only clergy who went abroad, by and large, were the bishops. And by the time we get to 1211, there was only one bishop left in England. And that's Peter de Roche. The other 16 bishops um, had either gone abroad or died and not been replaced. And because this wasn't working, Innocent decided to take this to the next step. He excommunicates John in November 1209. And this is important because this actually now not only means that if John dies while he's under um, excommunication, he cannot go to heaven. It also means that people are justified to remove him as king. And in 1211, uh, the papal nuncio, Pandolf, comes to England 
and issues John with a compromise with terms of compromise and the compromise terms are that he accepts the appointment of uh, Stephen Langton and that he accepts the Pope has overall responsibility for the appointment of bishops and archbishops and John rejects it he actually says that he's willing to talk about the appointment of Langton, he's willing to actually accept Langton, but he's not willing to accept the issue that the kings of England do not get a say in the appointment of bishops and archbishops. And so Pandolf in 1211 goes away without getting the agreement. Yet, two years later, John accepts virtually the exact same deal. And the reason for that is that Llewellyn, Prince of North Wales, he st starts to rebel, starts to encroach into John's lands in the Mar Welsh marshes, but he's also, more importantly, in contact with Philip Augustus in France. And there's a potential opportunity that Philip sees of using the interdict and the excommunication to invade England and there's rumours of an invading army of an army in France being built up for the invasion of England. But more importantly for John personally is that this in this period of time, 1211, 1212, John is actually starting to try and raise the taxes necessary for war against France, and the barons don't like his methods of financial extraction. To such an extent that some of them, such as Eustace de Versey and Robert Fitzwalter, um, actually are plotting against John. And they are in communication with Llewellyn. So there's this joined up threat that John faces. He even actually believes that there is a conspiracy to kill him. And because of this, this, this three-pronged threat from Llewellyn in Wales, from potential invasion of Philip in France, and from uh, unease and unrest um, by the Norman, North, sorry, Norman, Northern barons, John calls off his invasion to France in 1212. He, he has to use the forces that he's assembled to try and put down any potential unrest. And because of this threat that John now feels that he is facing, he sends word to Rome in 1213 that he will agree to the exact same terms that he rejected from Pandolf in 1211. But when John actually gives his agreement to the deal to end the interdict in May 1213, he goes further. He goes further by giving England to the Pope as a papal thief. He puts England under the Pope's protection. He gives it for him and his successors. That England is now ruled by the Pope. And the Pope will actually then give England back to John and his successors to rule on his behalf. The reason why he does this is that actually this means that if people try to rebel against him, they are ultimately rebelling against him as the Pope's representative and that this gives John's position greater strength. John also agrees to welcome back the rebels who had fled abroad under the deal to end the interdict. That he agrees that he will accept Eustace de Versey and Robert Fitzwalter back into the country. He also agrees it will pay 1,000 marks per year to the Pope as his feudal overlord. And once the interdict and the agreement is settled. Stephen Langton enters England in July 1213. He actually um, exchanges um, a kiss with King John, which shows uh, mutual respect. And Stephen Langton, as the Archbishop of Canterbury, lifts John 
gender excommunication. The interdict is still in force, and what that why the is still in force is that the clergy, or in this case, the representative of the Pope, um, is actually in talks with John about what the exact deal will be to end the interdict, in particular to do with compensation for the confiscation of the land. And negotiations happen because originally the the, the the amount that it looks like John's going to have to pay is 100,000 marks. And this is talked down in the end to 40,000 marks. And with the agreement of this and the payments of the original instalment promised, the interdict is lifted. In June 1214. But John actually, whilst England was under the interdict, did quite well out of the confiscation of church lands. It's estimated that he received somewhere in around the region of £11,000 per year from the church lands that had been confiscated. That doesn't include the cash windfall uh, from the land that was taken and then bought back with uh, bought back with money. The, the land that so John took a lot of the land and for the payment of a fine gave it back, but some of the other land was kept by uh, John's representatives um, to look after themselves and to take the profit themselves um, for the king, whilst the interdict was in force. And it was about eleven thousand pounds that John made each year during the interdict. Also, um, as seven bishops died, or were promoted, or, 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 decided, or were no longer to occupy um, the bishopric, John got the income from these as well, even though actually they are abroad. So for John, he financially did very well out of this. And there is some disagreement about how much John makes. Now that John's relationship with the church has been restored with the lifting of the interdict, it's quite clear that actually John has lost face. Here's a king who, in 1211, says, I am not going to accept Stephen Langston's Archbishop of Canterbury. I am not going to accept that the kings do not get a role um, in the appointment and are not consulted in the appointment of bishops and archbishops. And yet, in the deal to lift the interdict, John basically says he's going to do the exact opposite. But... After the lifting of the interdict, Nicholas of Tusculum, who is the cardinal who is sent to England on behalf of the Pope, and while he's in England, Nicholas of Tusculum um, is more senior to Pandolf as a papal legate and a cardinal. Nicholas is issued an instruction from Innocent. And the instruction for Innocent is that no bishop should be appointed without the consultation of the king. So Nicholas of Tusculum, who is the Pope's representative, who he sends to England, has official written instructions from the Pope that no bishop is to be appointed to England without um, the consultation of John. Indeed, actually, from May 1213 onwards, no bishops are appointed in England without the approval of John. And actually, that shows that whilst he backs down, actually, things very much go back to before, that he still has a say. On the topic of the compensation, remember, it was originally 100,000 marks, and this was then talked down in negotiations to 40,000 marks, 
In October 1214, John makes the very first payment, which is approximately 6,000 marks. He never makes another payment. So actually, the deal that was used to reach the end of the interdict doesn't look as though John has been as badly treated as you may believe. But John is starting to face pressure at home from the barons and from the problems he's having in trying to um, retake land in France. To shore up his position, in March 1215, he takes a crusade of vow because the common accepted view is that you do not destabilise the country um, if uh, the, the, the ruler is going to go on crusade. Also, by John doing this, it actually gives him um, greater leverage with the Pope as the Pope believes that he is more, he is going to support his crusading efforts. But the support of the church becomes crucial after the issuing of Magna Carta. And John informs Innocent III about Magna Carta and Innocent annuls it in August 1215. And he annuls it for two reasons. One reason is that actually he says that John signed it under duress, and of course it wasn't a free choice. And the second thing is, is that actually he's the king who holds England on behalf of the Pope, because it's the Pope's kingdom, and therefore no one can put limits on the Pope's power. So he annuls it. That means that actually he says it is not valid. And that's important because John, of course, um, when he actually signs it and issues it, he has to also um, take an oath. And so the church is now to support John in reversing Magna Carta. Because by the time we get to August, the rebels know that um, John is, well, find out that John has got Magna Carta annulled, um, and they actually start to go in open warfare against him, what is called the First Baron's War. And Innocent gives written orders to Pandelf, um, who is the papal legate. So once Nicholas of Tusculum leaves, Pandolf is in England, um, and Pandolf and the Abbot of Rebding receive written instructions from Innocent III. And the written instructions for Innocent um, are threefold. But one, all the rebels are to be excommunicated. Two, all the land that belongs to the rebels should be placed into interdict. And three, that actually they should issue orders that people should not support the rebels. And so the church's support of John is crucial. However, there is one churchman who seems reluctant to support John. And that's the Archbishop of Canterbury, the primate of all England, Stephen Langton. Stephen is slow to excommunicate the rebels, even though actually he is expected to. When John actually says he wants reinforcements to go to Rochester Castle, Langton does not send the reinforcements. And that allows Rochester Castle to be captured by the rebels. And so because of these things and the fact that actually John feels that Langton is not on his side, that actually he is more of a hindrance than a help, that he doesn't fully trust him, John writes to Innocent about Stephen Langton saying that actually he is not supporting the king, that his presence in England is actually destabilising and Pandolf supports him. And Pandolf receives the instruction to suspend Langton in September 1215. That actually he's got to leave England and go and visit the Pope. And the reason why he's got to visit the Pope is, if he wants his post back, he has to explain himself to Innocent in Rome. And so Pandolf issues this instruction. And in September 1215, Langton leaves the country. He actually then travels to Rome, meets Innocent, and Innocent restates him, but actually orders him to keep out of England until there's a peace, until the First Baron's Wars are over. Now, apart from... Stephen Langton, there is one other rebel, and that's the Bishop of Hereford, who is involved in the rebellion against John. And that is more really for local issues, okay, than actually is 
to do with him supporting the rebel cause. Like the Pope actually writes himself and issues his own personal excommunication for each of the people who are fighting in the First Barons' War, the leading barons in the First Barons' War. He personally has a papal excommunication of them. And in the absence of uh, Stephen Langton, Innocent sends uh, Cardinal Guala to come to England to lead the church in the absence of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And it's Guala who ultimately will take a leading role in the running of the country with the death of John in 